wiretaps without warrants. Surveillance of everyone. Who's in charge? And who's watching the watchers? Will anything change? And does this massive spending actually make America more secure? In the next hour, we decipher the top secrets, the open secrets, and the business secrets behind the intelligence industrial complex. It's a global security state. It's not a national security state. We venture into a world of dark secrets and dirty wars and reveal the ultimate secret of secrets. In a democracy forced to choose between rights and security. I welcome this debate. I think it's a sign of maturity. And so do we, because this is Empire. In 2013, Edward Snowden revealed that America's National Security Agency was listening in on, well, everybody. Everyone was shocked, deeply shocked. This weekend, portions of a highly classified Pentagon document came to light for all the world to see, brought cries of outrage from Washington. It was 1971. America was in the midst of the war in Vietnam. The Pentagon Papers revealed that presidents from four administrations, the generals and the intelligence services had all been lying about the Vietnam War. Everyone was deeply shocked. More stories about the CIA and the FBI spilled out of Watergate. Three separate investigations were launched. They discovered FBI agents in the post office steaming open letters without warrants, infiltrating civil rights and anti-war groups, disrupting them using blackmail. The women's movement became the target of political surveillance. The United States Army uh, had uh, used more than a 1,000 personnel uh, to engage in domestic spying in the United States. The CIA was also very active operating inside the country, which was not permitted, going around the world, conspiring to assassinate foreign leaders, and even enlisting the mafia to kill Fidel Castro. The NSA was running Operation Chamrock, listening in on every electronic communication into and out of the United States without warrants, and had been doing so for 30 years. Many Americans who were not even suspected of crime uh, were not only spied upon, but they were harassed, they were discredited, and at times, endangered. You know, every day they'd get a whole uh, computer disk, carry that down physically down to the NSA, and they would, like, listen to it and, and, and check out all the calls. Everyone was shocked, deeply shocked. The NSA said they'd shut Shumrock down, but they hadn't, not really. In 1988, Duncan Campbell revealed that the NSA listening posts had risen into the sky. They were now satellite-based, and they had a new name, Echelon. Before anyone could get too shocked, 9-11 happened, and a pumped-up president stepped forward to tell America... I vow to do everything in my power to prevent another attack on our nation. The Bush administration seized the opportunity to reject all the strains and let slip the dogs of snooping. The head of the pack himself promised that everything that NSA does is lawful and very carefully done. For carefully, read secretly. No courts, no warrants, nothing to slow down the action. Anything's lawful if no one knows about it. Echelon was giving a new lease of life and a new name, Solar Wind. Uh, the Bush administration uh, decided unilaterally it could uh, engage in um, whatever electronic surveillance it wanted to. People were shocked, deeply shocked. So help me God. So help me God. In 2007, Bush's Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez claimed the program had been discontinued. People might not have really believed him, 
but it didn't seem to matter because the next year, America elected a new president with a completely different attitude to his predecessor. This administration also puts forward a false choice between the liberties we cherish and the security we provide. Under scrutiny, the new president's new ideals were backed by a new attorney general's reassurance that change really had come to America. You are the attorney general. Is there any doubt in your mind that the warrantless wiretapping program was illegal? The concerns that I expressed then have really been remedied. Nothing had been remedied. Nothing had changed except Obama, whose policies had become Bush's. In 2012, William Binney, formerly the technical leader for intelligence in the NSA, revealed that the agency had indeed been spying on Americans and that all the major telecommunications companies were cooperating with them. There's something very odd here. The essence of what would be revealed in 2013 was already on the record, in public. Yet it passed without much fuss. But with Snowden, we were all shocked. Legal action should be taken against him. All over again. What does that mean? That there is a secret empire of surveillance and spying that constantly regenerates itself? Is this latest version of the scandal different than all the others? Fundamentally, we need to ask if the cult of secrecy actually makes the world safer or more dangerous. Those questions will be asked, at least here, at Empire, with film director Oliver Stone and war reporters Jeremy Scale and Rick Crowley. And we unravel the psychology of secrets with psychiatrist Justin Frank. But first, I am joined here in New York by Dana Priest, leading Washington Post investigative reporter on national security and the author of two books, including her most recent, Top Secret America, The Rise of the New American Security State. Michael Ratner, President Emeritus of the Center for Constitutional Rights and an attorney representing Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And Ivni Morozov, an expert on internet and privacy issues, author of two books, The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom, and his most recent, To Save Everything, Click Here, The Folly of Technological Solutionism. Well, gentlemen, Dana, welcome to Empire. Are, are you surprised, Michael, by uh, how many Americans don't mind this or support it even? You know, what, what I can't get over is, is now that we have an internet, most of our social interactions take place on the internet. Our discussions, instead of sending letters, instead of meeting somebody, and they're getting it all. And, and I can't understand why people aren't more upset by it, although a lot are, maybe 50%. I mean, think about, let's say you have a gun problem in New York City. Think if the police department decided we're going to go into every single house in New York City and look for guns. Wouldn't people be outraged by that? To find like 300 guns. But because it's happening electronically and they may not see it, uh, they don't seem to be as outraged. But they certainly should be. You have to understand that this is happening because it's the private sector that's doing most of the job for the NSA. Google can very easily say, we will encrypt, we'll make it secret, we'll encrypt your communication so that even us, the Google company, would not be able to look inside it. But if Google does it, it will not be able to sell advertising based on the content of our email. Google can very easily do that, but it won't. And, you know, as long as we accept Google's logic, NSA can come to Google and say, show us what you've got. Well, I, I have two questions for you about this. One, Mr. Internet Cassandra, as you were called, you, you tweeted that if you're not on the NSA watch list, that means you don't have a, you don't have a life. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was an ironic tweet, but I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that as you start collecting more and more information about someone, and as you start analyzing that person against other groups, uh, you will, you're bound to find something that would look suspicious. So people who say that I have nothing to hide, so I have nothing to worry about, but are completely wrong, because they do not understand that they will be compared with people and right. behaviors that they have no understanding of. So if I'm being compared to a group of people who have bought yogurts in the past, or hummus in the past, and they then went on to commit a crime, 
my own purchase of hummus or yogurt might suddenly look suspicious because I fit some other criteria that make me look like people in that group. And I myself think that I have nothing to worry about because all I've done was just make a couple of innocent purchases. The point here is, aren't people surrendering their privacy already? You, in the social media? Yeah, but there's a difference between surrendering it voluntarily to your friends and uh, maybe involuntarily to, uh, to businesses and giving it to the government. I mean, there's an inherent distrust of the government, except back to your question, why do so many people accept this? I think when it comes to, to counterterrorism and overall, you know, national security safety, people want to trust the government more than distrust it even though we have a history of abuses within, within the government. And one of the reasons why I think that still exists is that politicians cannot, have not debated whether we've grown too big in this, whether things are going off the rail, because who is going to say we shouldn't have that counterterrorism program? You really politically put yourself at risk if you say that, because the other side is going to say you're soft on terrorism. What they're saying is, this is the lesser of two evils. At the end of the day, if you don't have that, you're going to have something much worse. And I'll tell you, I've just read something in the editorial of the, um, of the Wall Street Journal. It says, you better accept this. Otherwise, in case of another 9-11, expect biometric national ID cards, curfews, surveillance drones over the homeland, and even mass roundups of ethnic or religious groups. Aren't you better off with what's going on now? You know, they, they put forth a justification as to why, why they had to do all this. And they said, here's the plots that we've uncovered, 50 plots. And you look at them, and they testified about two of them. And neither of them made any sense at all. Neither of them were scary at all. So they haven't even come up with a good justification for this massive database. And to go back to what's being said, when once they have it, it its usefulness is very high. We're a few blocks from Occupy Wall Street now. Think of the next demonstration we have where hundreds of us are down at Occupy Wall Street and they have our complete network and web of all our friends and everybody else. The question is, what are they gonna do with that? Are they gonna simply let us demonstrate or are they gonna identify every single one of us and start knocking on our doors? And so, that's a serious concern. And you know, the government is building from the ground up, from the local communities up, they are building more data on individuals within small communities, filtering it through these fusion centers that have proliferated in every state, and handing it over to the FBI, which keeps it in a database that we aren't even talking about, but that is there, which is a suspicious activities reporting database called Guardian. So there is going to be, for the Occupy uh, example, a lot of ground up data on all of these individuals that they're looking at to begin with in a, in a free speech kind of assembly way because they say those assemblies sometimes can be used by terrorists. And so, you know, in the 70s, they did exactly that with address books for all of us. They would find your address book somewhere and they would open, the FBI would open a file on every single person in the address book because they thought they were associated with this person or that person. We're gonna open a file and we're gonna investigate them and surveil them. Now it's done on a much more massive way. So who's watching the watchers then? That, Who's watching over them? That's the key question to me, because even... And what's the answer? Uh, I asked the question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there isn't... There is, the watchers are watching themselves. The furthest you get outside... What does that mean, though? It means that people who have clearances, who can't talk about what they see, they are the ones that are watching the people who are like them. The furthest that you get from that is Congress. They're supposed to be part of the checks and balances on the system. And Congress is, has a terrible record at paying attention to the details of technical programs and understanding how these work. And they're intimidated, they're intimidated to question so no, the So no one is world. watching the watchers then? But Which even, is a recipe for disaster, but, no? But you have to understand that even if Congress was watching carefully what NSA was doing, that would only apply to American citizens, right? That's the task of Congress, right? They would not necessarily care about the fact that the privacy of Germans or French or so the prison, uh, Chinese the so are prison being... program, right? Exactly, right. I mean, because it's which not... Is surveying the, everyone around the, the world. The surveillance programs that NSA has developed, they do not just neatly apply to Americans, right? And don't just neatly apply to foreigners. It's very hard to separate between the two. But even if there was this neat separation, Congress doesn't really care much about the interests of foreign people, right? And this is where a lot of tension is right now, because the Chinese, the Russians, the Germans, the British, 
you know, not necessarily their governments who actually happen that the Americans are collecting all the data because they share it. The citizens are very concerned and they're beginning to investigate whether they have any other options in terms of email. Or and I tell you what, and, and probably another reason for this is that this is becoming such a huge business. And for us to start talking about the business of security, we're going to first uh, look at uh, this quick uh, recap or summary of the intelligence industrial complex that you wrote about so much. Let's look at that. One of the secrets that the keepers of the secrets like to keep secret is their budget. The best estimate is 80 to 100 billion dollars a year. Most goes to private contractors. It's the kind of business in which failure doesn't mean that you don't get paid. It means you get paid more. You know, you live a privileged life. You, you're living in Hawaii, in, in paradise, and making a ton of money. What would it take to make you leave everything behind? It's a very incestuous business. The director of national intelligence, James Clapper, the fellow who refers to telling lies as giving the least untruthful answer, was an executive at Booz Allen, the contractor that employed Edward Snowden. A previous director, of the national intelligence under George Bush is now Booz Allen's vice chairman. The thing is, we don't know what kind of deals people make while they're in government with the companies they later join. We don't know what kind of understandings or compromises they might make to make sure that they do get those jobs afterwards or even to come back and work for the government from those companies. All that's hidden. And there's a built-in conflict of interest with, with private interest making money from this. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't really understand why it hasn't gotten more discussion because, after all, they're not just doing this, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because they want to make money, and they make a lot of money. Dana, one trillion dollars, like a thousand billion dollars spent on intelligence over the last 10, 12 years. You can't fight that now, can you? <laughs> well, a lot of that money, uh, after 9-11, Congress just poured the money out, wrote basically blank checks to the intelligence world in the hopes that that didn't happen again, another 9-11. And, but they didn't want to grow government. So they ended up spending a lot of that money on contractors. And when we looked at how many contractors work in the intelligence world, just who have top secret clearances, it's about 400,000. Uh, it's about one third of the total. And those and those corporations, those contractors, they're in it for profit, right? Not for yes, security. Yes, they're definitely in it for. <laughs> Which is normal. Some, what country do you think you're in? Some of them come out of the the security world, so they would say they're very loyal and patriotic. But the bottom line is they're there to make money. And and Booz Allen, for example, his company is one of the leading companies to do this work. 99% of what they do is government work, so they're sort of like a little government. They have 10,000 people with top secret clearance on their payroll. You know, one, a couple of interesting things about it, you have also massive amounts of money, presumably from these corporations, going into congressional campaigns and Senate campaigns. So they lobby. So, so they, lo they lobby and they probably give co campaign contributions, all kinds of things going on. Uh, so you have that, which in terms of oversight means that Congress isn't going to be doing the strongest oversight. The other thing, when you get these massive amounts of people being hired by Booz Allen and other places, I remember I was at a talk by my client, Julian Assange, before Snowden comes out. And he says, you know, one thing that's going to happen in a massive surveillance state is there's going to be hundreds, thousands of people they have to hire who are under 30 years old. And those people aren't always going to have the same politics as the government. And there's going to be people coming out all the time. So that, I think we can expect more Snowdens, despite what I call the hammer against them. As soon as the logic of security becomes the logic of making profit, then supply and demand means it's going to continuously right. expand, regardless of the security needs, correct? One of my uh, favorite sources called it a self-licking ice cream cone. It's a, a closed system in which you need a clearance to get the information about what's going to be you know, available to purchase and to give to the government. And as you were saying, the donations are in there. People who used to be in Congress work for these security companies. They all know each other. And it's very hard for outsiders, especially because we don't have clearances, to understand 
what is going on on the inside. Nor can we file any freedom of information requests because those are right. private companies, right? I mean, there are all sorts of other factors which make it even more complicated to build any accountability into this. When someone like McConnell, now working for the private sector, goes on the record in the op-ed section of the Washington Post saying that there is a cyber war going on and there have been five attacks, but they're classified. I cannot discuss them, but give us another billion to fight them. That's not a claim anyone can assess, right? Because again, the information that he wants to use to build up case for his own company is classified. I do think that is the, a, an important point on corporations. They just want to make it bigger and bigger and bigger, despite whether we need it or not. So, so when you look at it this way, when you look at the hundreds of lobbyists, when you look at major corporation and a trillion dollar business, and you look at the huge intelligence community and an intelligence industrial complex, you know, poor President Obama, I mean, he's just a lonely guy in the White House. <laughs> Well, that's true, in a sense, although they're carrying out the policies that he favors and maintains. And the problem is that, uh, you know, as you were saying, if the, if the government wants to look at itself and say what really works here, because that's the bottom line question, you know, we're, we're 12 years after this, what is effective in fighting terrorism? Are they, you think they're surveying us now? <laughs> I'm not sure, right? It's a drone. It's a drone. <laughs> no, I think it's a helicopter. It's, I, can, I can hear it, it's a helicopter. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, but, you know, this question of what works and what doesn't work is so, is so crucial to figuring out how you maintain an effective system without going overboard and without letting contractors who have a profit motive continue to grow this system. But there's no imperative to do that, going back to the political question, partly because Congress and elected politicians aren't brave enough to say, let's look at what we're getting for our money. I mean, let's really scrutinize it. Again, afraid of being called soft on terrorism. I want to end with this point, and that's very important because I think this is what the program needs to be about, the probing of power bit of it. It seems to me that secrecy is probably very good for dictatorship, whether they're the former East Europeans or, or others in the third world. And openness is probably the best thing that serves democracy. Is that correct or, or am I mistaken? We, li we live in a 200 year tradition here. Isn't openness it's, a, an important ingredient for democracy? It's, it's critical and it's why the government was set up the way it is and why the media has some sort of protection against the state when they do things that the government doesn't like. So that's something that is sort of on the, on the chopping block right now with all these leaks. Hopefully, you know, we will maintain our independence. I think that we will. We will always fight against, against uh, encroachment of that freedom. And you think this new generation is capable of speaking out and resisting? I, mean, I think they've made a big difference already. I mean, I think, you know, the government is obviously very concerned. I mean, their sledgehammer, uh, uh, taking a sledgehammer to people like, you know, Bradley Manning, Julian Assange, Snowden, uh, and others out there is an indication of how nervous they are about their secrets coming out that may give us more democracy. You know, when we were litigating the early cases after 9-11 having to do with secret immigration hearings, a federal judge in the Sixth Circuit said, democracy dies behind closed doors. Uh, and that's, that's completely correct. This is a great line for us to end. Thank you for joining Empire. And I will be back with uh, Oliver Stone, Jeremy Scale, Rick Rowley, and Justin Frank after the break. Secrets are not good for the security of the democracy, and in the long run, they're not good for the security of anybody. If you create all this great power in the hammer, they're looking for the nail, they want the nail. Wherever the nail is, if the nail's over here, they just want to pound it. You can't be an elephant chasing in the jungle of flea. And that's what we are. So we did everything wrong. Welcome back. Nowhere has a security state been as intrusive as in the domain of foreign policy. And nowhere has the failures of the intelligence community been as pervasive as in its covert, dirty wars. The intelligence community's record of failure in analysis is astonishing. They thought North Korea wouldn't invade South Korea and were certain the Chinese wouldn't back them up. They thought they could overthrow Castro. They missed the coups in Cambodia and Greece and the 1973 October War. They didn't anticipate the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and missed their decision to pull out. They didn't expect the fall of the Shah and the rise of the Ayatollahs. They missed 
the fall of the Soviet Union. They thought they were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and miscalculated the 2003 occupation of that country. These are some of the defining historic moments that we know the intelligence community didn't know when they should have. But we also know about what they did know and plan from, among others, Oliver Stone's untold history of the United States. In 1970, Attorney General John Mitchell gloated, this country is going so far right that you are not going to recognize it. But how much further to the right could the U.S. go? In 1970, there was Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, nuclear threats, surveillance, sabotage, dirty tricks, official lies, racial polarization, crime, and still to come were the war on drugs, Chile, and Watergate. But compared to the world that Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush would usher in, one could almost look back nostalgically on the Nixon era. I caught up with a renowned film director in New York and began by asking him about the significance of America's reaction to 9-11. This country has lost its mind after 2001. We lost our mind. We overreacted to this uh, terrorist threat as if it was the, uh, a new war for all time. And we've been living in emergency conditions with an overbloated security state that costs a fortune. We literally lost our minds because we, did, we lacked courage. We lacked the courage to uh, assess the situation directly on 2001 and to say, why did they attack us? But would you say that this is not only not just a 12-year issue because you are, of all people, you've done the untold history of the United States. You've, tra you've traced it back to 1947. This is a horror story. I've lived it. <laughs> but uh, in truth, uh, 1947, the, when they started to, they really, st the CIA got created in 1947. Military intelligence had been around before that. But essentially, the world changed. Even Harry Truman, in 1963, said, and he wrote this, he said, we have created an American Gestapo in the CIA. In the 1940s, 50s, 60s, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, was starting to maintain hundreds of thousands of files on Americans, individual Americans, for whatever reason. If they had some vague leftist, uh, left, mostly leftist uh, affiliation, if they joined organizations. And then when the war on terror happened, it went from a few hundred thousand people to millions. And now, right now, we're everybody. Every single American is being listened to in some way or another and also being watched. So that's probably what is shocking but hardly surprising. It's the fact that they're not, casting is, the net so it's, wide, it's, isn't it's, it? It's, listen, it's, if we ever survive this history and we look back on this century or two, our behavior, the government's behavior, is insane. You cannot watch all its citizens. You cannot regulate them. How scared must we be? America, throughout its uh, national security state, has always felt as if it's the threatened one, it's the weaker isn't it? one. And it's that's a paradox because we're so, we got the big muscles and the and more we secure, act, and we act secure. like a 98-pound weakling. You voted for Barack Obama. I voted twice. Is he disappointing, or were you just naive? He he deplored the war in Iraq. He deplored Bush's use of uh, tactics after 2001. He deplored the war on terror, the way it was being fought. It sounded like, a, like we're going to have a change, a real change. That never happened. Never happened. If anything, as we show in our chapter on uh, Obama and Bush, the war on terror, we called it, the age of terror, because it is terror, uh, they, he expanded the powers. He expanded the presidential powers. What President Obama is saying is that the choice is between either wars and boots on the ground yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan the or, the, or surveillance. The politicians have been lying to us for at least since 2001. They've been lying. They make everything false, false opposites. It's either terror or security. So we put in very heavy-handed America, like in Vietnam. Where if you have to bomb the whole place, you bomb the whole place. You don't think, you, you, Agent Orange, you throw, you defoliate the jungle. You know, there, there was a great quote from 2001, you know, we're looking for a needle in the haystack, but we need the haystack. In other words, if you create all this great power in the hammer, they're looking for the nail, they want the nail. Wherever the nail is, if the nail's over here, they just want to pound it. You can't be an elephant chasing in the jungle of flea. And that's what we are. So we did everything wrong. You clearly see this as a blowback. 
It's a blowback situation, totally, because of our CIA involvement in the Middle East, because of our behavior in Afghanistan. We, we wanted the fundamentalists. We wanted the fundamentalists in Iran in 1979 when Khomeini came back. He was our choice. We did not want a secular leftist uh, regime in, uh, in Iran because we knew that our oil and all and, and would be threatened. And as we said earlier, it seems like there is constant failure on the part of the CIA to predict anything that goes on. Uh, not only a failure to predict, but our objectives have been wrong. We wanted, Bill Casey was a Christian, a devout Christian. He was essentially a fundamentalist. The former director of the CIA. And he wanted the, the fundamentalists in Afghanistan. He, saw, he thought that the fundamentalists were the key to destroying Soviet communism. And we know Khomeini hated communists. We know Osama had no, uh, no truck for, uh, for Soviet Union. So uh, Casey achieved his objective, but his objective was not in the interest of humanity because fundamentalism never is. Fundamentalism is too extreme for humanity. We need a moderate middle path for humanity to succeed. Here in the United States, you see this going where? Are we, are we about to witness new McCarthyism going in? in what the do you country? mean new McCarthyism? We've had McCarthyism for, uh, since 1950. You think it's a continuous thing? McCarthy was the extreme. The problem in America is the neutrals, the people in the middle, the, the liberals, the so cold the warriors. And your major disappointment with Obama is that he, he not only did not repudiate Bush, he perpetuated Bush. Not only, yeah, but Obama perpetuated the war on terror with soft, soft power, he called it, but essentially it's pretty ruthless. These drone attacks in all these countries they have increased the number of terrorists. Uh, you know, essentially there was what, after uh, 2001, there was some 50 people on the terror lists, 50 people. Now it's what, thousands? You know, because whenever you militarize a situation and you start killing people, of course you create more and more violence. Violence begets violence, it's as old and as I guess, the Bible. And I guess the bigger the national security state, it's, now, it's not going to shrink. It's a global so. security state. It's not a national security state. We have a global empire. We have space uh, weapons of unbelievable power. We have drones. We have cyberspace. We will be Darth Vader. We will be the strong man, and we will be terrified of anybody who comes and protests, and we'll be watching everything. We will be hated by the whole world. It won't last, because no empire in any movie ever lasts. And in history, no empire lasts. To expand on the tilt Oliver Stone talks about, I went to see Dirty Wars, a new documentary that captures the dark secrets of the U.S. war on terror. I got a strange phone call. Someone from the inside was reaching out to me. Someone close to the heart of the president's elite force. There are hundreds of covert operations on multiple continents with the full support of the White House. It's hard to say when this story began. Greetings from Kabul, Afghanistan. This was supposed to be the front line in the war on terror. What's the name of this village out here? But I knew I was missing the story. There was another war, hidden in the shadows. So there's the, the two men in the guest house were the mm -hmm. first people killed. You saw the U.S. forces take the bullets out of the body. On your face! Who were these men that stormed into Dawood's home? And why would they go to such horrifying lengths to cover up their actions? What we have essentially done is created one hell of a hammer. And for the rest of our generation, this force will be continually searching for an end. Despite whatever conspiratorial theories, there's nothing to it. To discuss Washington's covert strategies, I sat down with its filmmakers, Rick Crowley and Jeremy Scale. All right, gentlemen, Rick, Jeremy, welcome to Empire. Thank you. Thanks, man. It seems like you go on a hunt of sort from right from the outset, looking for JSOC. What is that? What does it mean exactly? The Joint Special Operations Command is, is different than the rest of the military in that it doesn't always operate within the traditional chain of command. It, it really is sort of like the president's private army. It's small, it's elite. Uh, for much of its history, it started in 1980. It has operated in the shadows of, uh, of U.S. policy. Um, involved under the Pentagon? Well, I mean, it's military, so it's under the right. Pentagon, but, but j just, just to understand, this is an operation, a, a force that does covert missions, like the CIA does covert missions, that can be denied if they go wrong or if the U.S. just doesn't want its fingerprints all over So it. completely secretive. Yeah, in fact, the, the, so the, the very existence of it was, was a secret until just a few years ago. So, the, I mean, the word special, special means secret in this case? Here, here's how I would put it. This, this force, started in 1980 out of the ashes of the failed hostage rescue mission in Iran. And the idea of JSOC was that it was going to be a, an elite secret all-star team. 
taking what at the time was known as SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, the 75th Army Rangers, and then the most elite pilots in the US military called the Night Stalkers. After 9-11, Cheney, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld viewed JSOC not just as a tool that could be used to hunt targets around the world, but as the policy itself. The kill capture program became the policy with the emphasis on kill. And so JSOC is put on steroids. And the oversight is for whom? Well, uh, there's very little oversight. I mean, it's, they're, they're covert operations, so they're, they're concealed from the American public. Uh, they run, I mean, they report directly to the executive wing, and they are only briefed to this tiny little uh, gang of, uh, gang of six in the, in the Congress, like the few gang people, gang of eight in the Congress, who are the few members of the, of the Senate's um, in, in House intelligence committees. So there's very little transparency and oversight, and, and those members of the, of the intelligence committees are not even allowed to tell the American people what's happening there. But <coughs> under the Bush administration, they were authorized under the Al-Qaeda net, uh, network execute order to operate in, in a couple dozen countries. Uh, those programs expanded under Obama, so it went up to over 70. And it was leaked a, a, a while ago, a few months ago, that there was a day last year when they were on the ground in 100 countries on the same day. So it's a, it's a massive program that was... 100 countries on the same day? Yeah. So we're not just talking Somalia and Yemen and so on. Well, look, I mean, many of the countries where they're operating, I mean, they're in Latin America uh, working on targeting drug cartels. Um, they've been throughout uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, there. Um, they've operated in, uh, in Chechnya, uh, in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, they've done covert missions inside of Iran. But m many, of the, many of the places where they're operating, there are small teams of SEALs or Delta Force guys that are embedded with special operations forces of other nations. And technically they're there as trainers or advisors. But often what happens is that they get involved with direct, with what are called kinetic actions. And they're part of JSOC. Yeah, part of JSA. When we look today in Afghanistan and we look at the television screens in America or outside America, what reports are there from Afghanistan outside Kabul? There's very little. There, there's almost none. I mean, first so of all... Is it already a forgotten war now? And this JSOC is a... Yeah. It's kind of... Yeah, I mean, there's... So in look, the shadows? Every, everyone in America now knows every single detail about one night raid, the raid that killed bin Laden. We know how many uh, SEALs were in the helicopters. We know the make of the helicopters. We know the rifles they carried. We know every, every detail. Uh, but we, what the American people don't know is that that same night, there were between 10 and 20 other night raids in Afghanistan, thousands of night raids happening every year. Uh, part of it is, so we're drowned in details from this one raid, and that raid is supposed to stand in and define what these 10 years, this more than a decade of war meant. Uh, but the whole body of that war, what that war, the real significance of that war for the world and for us as a country is, is completely concealed. So you say that this actually has mutated and, and has become far more global than anyone could have imagined. But we hear President Obama saying, you know, the war needs to end. What you're yeah. saying is, this is exactly the contrary. The war is expanding. Well, you know, when, when President Obama spoke at the National Defense University in May, uh, I almost felt like Senator Obama was debating President Obama. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was sort of speaking out of both, both sides of his mouth. Um, you know, on the one hand, he's saying, you know, civilian deaths are gonna haunt me to the day I die, and we can't be in a state of perpetual war, and we're gonna bring accountability to, you know, this program. But if you, if you strip it down to its, to its rawest form, what, what did President Obama do in that speech? He asserted uh, this radical American exceptionalist agenda, the idea that the United States has a right to bomb any country where it determines its national security interests are, are at play. I mean, he is creating, with his administration, a permanent infrastructure that is intended to legitimize and argue that it's legal, this idea that uh, the U.S. can assassinate people around the globe. That, that's going to be one of the enduring legacies of Obama's so-called counterterrorism. This is program. interesting because when we spoke to Oliver Stone earlier, he said something about that instead of repudiating what Bush did, he's actually perpetuating what, uh, what Bush did. But having said that, since we're sitting in a movie theater, I'm reminded by uh, the film A Few Good Men. Uh, at one point, uh, Jack Nicholson, Col Colonel Jessup says, you rise and you sleep under the blanket with which I provide, and then you question the way I provide it. Yeah. You should either say thank you, or get on your way, carry a gun and stand on the wall, and I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. What's the alternative? 
Well, see, this is one of the greatest fallacies of the whole logical construct of the global war on terror. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced from covering this for more than a decade that we're creating more enemies than we're killing in these, uh, in these strikes that are supposedly taking out terrorists. I mean, just look, even if you don't have political problems with the lack of transparency, this massive overstep in executive power, uh, strategically, it's been profoundly counterproductive. So profoundly if it's not working, why then is it expanding? Well, Why are they getting away with it? Is, is this the dark secret of all secrets? No, look, I, I mean, I actually think that there's, that there's, uh, there's a logic to it, and that's, that's part of what makes it so dangerous. I think that President Obama, let, let, let's look, look at his, his history. This is a guy with no military experience, very limited foreign policy experience when he comes into office. He's briefed by Admiral William McRaven, the JSOC commander, General David Petraeus, one of the most powerful people in modern American military history, uh, the heads of the CIA uh, and other intelligence agencies, and they paint a picture for him. Uh, of a world where there are hundreds of concurrent threats against the United States, attempts to bring down airplanes, to poison the water supplies. What, what's Obama going to say to them when they say, we need expanded authorities to start striking? We need to preemptively kill the terrorists before they kill us. And if you don't do that, there's going to be an attack on the American homeland. This is how it's presented to him. I think there are real threats around the world. And, but what I think happened is that Obama was seduced by this idea that you can preemptively kill the bad guys before they hit you. Preventive, and, and he, preemptive. Right, we're engaged in what, what in pre-crime, like the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise. You know, President Obama expanded these things called signature strikes. The idea that you can target a group of military-aged males whose identities you don't know and against whom you may have no evidence that they're involved with a crime, but you're targeting them on the idea that their pattern of life indicates that they are involved with or may someday be involved with uh, terror plots. So it's perpetual. It's managing a perpetual state uh, situation of, of manageable violence, trying to just deny, knowing that they're going to grow and become stronger on the ground in places like Yemen and Somalia, but preventing them from gaining the logistical sophistication necessary to get on a plane and come to the U.S. Unless we back away from this uh, radical American exceptionalist view of the world and the idea that American lives are worth more than other people's lives and that they're not worthy of our empathy, nothing is fundamentally going to change in our society. So that, that's part of what we tried to do in the film. Parts of this war are hidden completely, are never reported, and the parts that are in the U.S. too often, you know, we see this war filmed from the noses of bombs or from, you know, helicopter or drone footage, and we hear it narrated to us by former generals on cable news. I mean, we never get to have the camera on the other side of that whole military media apparatus. So, yeah, I mean, a huge... And one of the things that film does, I think, better than any other medium, is create the possibility for human identification with people who you're separated from by this massive cultural and geographic distance. We're all for human identifications. Yeah. Gentlemen, Rick, Jeremy, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks. After discussing the politics, economics, and strategy of the national security state, we turn to the psychology of the Guardians of Secrets with Justin Frank, George Washington University professor of psychiatry, best known for his books, Bush on the Couch and Obama on the Couch. Professor Frank, welcome to Empire. Is Snowden crazy? No, he's not. Is he just an angry young man? No, he's not. Is he a narcissist? He has narcissistic features, but so do we all. So that doesn't mean he's a bad guy? No. So why are the media pundits, the, the stars of the mainstream media going after him? Character assassinations. Well, because he's done something that most people don't do. He's Which done is... what the little child did in the emperor's new clothes. He said, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. What Snowden did was he said, you know, I can just say what I think because I think it, and it's really important. So why did and they the go... news people are not used to that. So why did they go after the messenger, not the message? Because we always go after the messenger. So Snowden. it's convenient to scapegoat it's Snowden. It's convenient to scapegoat Snowden because then we don't have to think about actually the message he's conveying to us. We don't have to pay attention to what that message is. We don't have to be uh, upset about it. We don't have to start second guessing what our democracy is about, what our country is about, because what he's doing is something that's very democratic. He's speaking out. So I guess a bunch of older men representing the establishment are unhappy with a younger man who's questioning the establishment. Older men in general don't like younger men. They say they do, but they don't. I mean, I'm They're an envious. exception. <laughs> They're envious. They're envious of youth. In fact, Cicero, uh, that Latin guy, said something like, uh, a country that hates its youth has no future. And he understood that about Rome. Because what happens is generals send young people out to get killed. And I think part of it is an envy of youth. Speaking war. of sending 
young kids get killed, former Vice President Cheney thinks that Snowden is dangerous. Yes. Who's the dangerous among the two? Cheney is one of the most dangerous people ever to be, pre ever to be in public office. He's a lying, dangerous person who really knows how to abuse power and uh, shut people up. So what about President Obama? He certainly knows how to shut people off. The, probably one of the most secretive presidents I've, I've read since Nixon. He's a secretive president, but in a different way. He's got, I, what I would say is he's got a very good soul, but he grew up having to be secretive. Yeah. Which means he's also always lived with contradictions. He's always lived with contradictions, but he's lived with secrets. There's two parts. Living with, with contradictions is part of maturity which has to do with you can actually recognize that we're not in an either-or world. Not with it's us or not, against us. It's not with us or against us, which is Bush's mentality, and it's the mentality of every 10-year-old at one point in their lives. But when you're older and you're more mature, you realize that people have good and bad qualities. Is that why both. he can and see? And Obama can see those things. Is, is that why he can see that you, you can both have privacy and security at the same time? Yes. You can have privacy and Regardless whether he's secure. right or wrong. I think he's wrong in this, but I do think he understands that. And he's got a terrible responsibility, a big, huge one as president, which is that he's got to protect our security. And he's honest about that. He even said when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, he said right away to the committee, by the way, I have a conflict of interest. I'm the president of the United States, and that comes first, and I may have to fight a war. That's right, but Justin, I mean, that also means he's protecting his turf because secrecy is our? Secrecy is his way. And he really does not like whistleblowers. He likes transparency for other people, but not for himself. He likes to speak of it. Yes. But he doesn't practice it. No. Well, certainly he's been outspoken. He's written, I think, 699 speeches thus far, or yeah. been involved and in And he the... writes them, most of them. But one of the interesting things about uh, this whole surveillance that's being established is that free individuals with free will who make up what we agree about, which is democracy, if they live in fear, how does that then, sir, how does that work out with democracy? How does that square with democracy? Well, it doesn't square with democracy. If you live in fear, what fear does is it teaches you to keep your mouth shut. That's why the rape victims in the military don't come forward. That's why uh, battered women don't report their husbands, very rarely. Why rape victims in regular society don't... Because they're being double humiliated. Well, no, because they're afraid of retaliation. It's like if you come forward, you're going to be really, yeah, you're going to be screwed twice. Yeah, there's going to be double retaliation. And that's what, and that's what Snowden had to go through. And that's now. what Snowden is going to go through. And so, the, the, but, the, but in a democracy then, people who live in fear are going to curtail their behavior. And in the long run, they're not going to be able to be open about their thoughts, about their feelings. They're not going to be able to make informed judgments. They're going to end up wanting to believe whatever the people in power uh, say they should believe instead of questioning power, questioning authority, and being really true people living in a democracy. Well, so, I guess then in that sense, it's dangerous. Well, certainly, then, sec <laughs> secrets are not good for the security of democracy. Secrets are not good for the security of the democracy, and in the long run, they're not good for the security of anybody. Well, on that uh, note, Professor Frank, thank you. Thank you. And I'll be back with a final thought. I said I would reveal the ultimate secret of secrets. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So, go to our website or our Facebook page to watch our very final thoughts. And make sure to follow us on Twitter. Until next time.